in Iran recently, um, the, uh, the, the same thing was happening. Protesters were using Twitter, and the American government ate it up. They were like, this is the best thing ever. They asked Twitter to like not go down for maintenance so that the Iranian uh, protesters could continue to protest using Twitter. But as soon as someone does it in U.S. soil, it's not free speech. It's, you know, uh, a felony. Um, and so he got arrested, eventually got out in cash bail. He goes back to uh, Queens where he lives uh, in a house that he owns. Um, uh, and it gets raided a week later. They come in at four in the morning, they kick down the door, they, uh, uh, they don't arrest anyone, they just handcuff them and leave them on the couch. And they're like, you're free to leave. If you leave, you can't come back and watch what we're doing to your house. Uh, they kill the pet bird, they confiscate everything, they like let it out into the, you know, into the night air, never to be seen again. Um, they confiscate like everything. They're like pulling down curious George posters, and they're pulling down posters of Marx. And then it comes out in the media too. They're like, and he had posters of Marx that they confiscated, as if this is like a problem. And it's really funny, to me, as if it's like funny, because I'm like, what the hell? And then I'm like, actually, it is funny. Why does he have posters of Marx? Like, what's this deal with that? But, um, but whatever. He had posters of Marx. Now he doesn't because the the government has them, and they won't tell him why. It's not even related to the twittering thing, supposedly. Uh, everyone was able to act, come together and basically get the Twitter in charges dropped by causing a huge fuss. Um, a lot of like the internet nerd crowd got behind it and put a lot of weight into it because um, they don't really listen to the anarchist crowd, honestly. And so I was really glad that the person they picked on has two master's degrees, owns a house, and is a popular author um, who uh, is still an anarchist and was still like willing to stand by that. And so they're like basically like they're trying to accuse him. Ah, this comes around to my book. Uh, they confiscate all the all these books that he wrote and they make a big deal of it. He's an author. He he writes anarchist texts as if this uh, in any way is a problem um, in, a, in a, a free society, which to me points to why when I say free society I give a little air quotes. Um, anyway, I feel the need to tell about what's happening to him. He doesn't know what's happening to him. They drop the felonies. He's facing all kinds of weird grand jury stuff. He doesn't understand what's going on. He's uh, trying to deal with all this like crazy legal stuff. As, Life is kind of wrecked. He's still writing fiction with uh, his, his collective um, through it all, which is really amazing. Um, and, um, and they won't unseal the warrant as to why they raided his house. It's like a 40-page warrant, 36-page warrant or something. And they won't tell him why they're going through all of this stuff. And one of the really funny ironies is that like one of the people who works there works for the government, so they actually confiscated their own computers and won't let them have their own computers back because um, they're like property of the government. Anyway, whatever. Um, Okay, so now I'm going to get to this very important PowerPoint presentation that Chris is going to hold up because. Oh. Um, and I, I will I will read it for everyone who's because this is an awkward setup. Although it's a very nice bookstore. Maybe we should angle it. Sorry. You ever see? Okay, so anarchism and fiction: a very serious presentation. This person says, "Yay!" Their shirt says, "No lords, no rings." So I'm going to talk about some anarchist fiction writers. I'm going to talk about Dumbudzo Maricera. Dumbudzo Maricera was a post-colonial African writer uh, in England. And he, uh, he was uh, accused by the, uh, the proper post-colonial African writers that he wasn't writing in the proper post-Marxist or like Marxist realist style that everyone was supposed to be writing in to properly express the you know, needs of the post-colonial African world. Um, and his quote in response to this to the media is, well, if you are a writer for a specific nation or a specific race, then fuck you. Uh, and that's Dumbazo Maricera, 1952 to 1987. Um, ah, wait, it goes on. Okay, so he was raised poor in Zimbabwe. Um, and, uh, or it was now Zimbabwe. Um, and he was uh, accepted into the school because he's really smart, but um, he got kicked out because he was protesting the racism of his newly integrated school. And uh, so he gets kicked out, and he gets kicked out a bunch of times. And then eventually they invite him to Oxford, uh, just because he's a really good writer, and they haven't caught on. So he goes to Oxford. And uh, I'm going to stand here. And then, yeah, thanks. My arms will get tired. Oh, well, you can see, you pull them lower. You can hold it lower, just angle it, is what I'm saying. Can everybody see it? Yeah, all right. Yeah. Um, usually I have these friends on tour with me, and I make them do this. Uh, but no way to, okay. okay. All right, so, 1977, expelled for the attempted arson of his residence hall. This is Oxford, it's, it's clearly on fire, at least in the illustration. And he says, I am so wealthy and my school is on fire. That's not Dumbudza, that's someone else. Um, 
So he gets uh, he gets expelled, um, and uh, he becomes a squatter, uh, and he starts hanging out and squats and on the streets. Um, and in, in England, and uh, and, he, and he writes the whole time he's doing this, and he he publishes like a really important book, and I am crap. Okay, he publishes a really important book. That I can't remember the name right now because I'm an idiot. Um, and uh, and he he wins these awards, and uh, and they take him to the award ceremony, and he, he's a little upset by the whole thing anyway, because he's this like uh, anarchist squatter, and uh, and they they take him to the award ceremony. In my mind, it takes place in this like thing that looks like Hogwarts, because it just seems like a good place for this. And they're like, here's your award, and instead he gets drunk and smashes all the dishes in the place. Um, and then he goes back to Africa with a, a white filmmaker who's supposed to make a novel, uh, a movie of his novel, um, and uh, fires the filmmaker and dies homeless on the streets of AIDS. But he wrote a whole bunch of books and they got really more political as he went. Okay. And then we have, you can want it like low, you don't have to kill yourself. Oh, I can go like this? I don't know. Did everybody see it? It was, it was a very awkward setup. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, this so this better. is, yeah, this is Stepniak. Stepniak lived from 1851 to 1895. Um, and Stepniak was raised in Russia. Uh, he was a soldier for a little while. He caught on real quickly that that was not his role in life, at least not soldier for the state. Uh, so he, he leaves the army and he fights an insurgency. Uh, he writes a book on guerrilla warfare. Um, and then he goes and he participates in the first act of propaganda by the deed by anarchists. Um, and in 1877, Stepniak and more than 30 armed anarchists liberate two towns in Benevito, Italy, burning tax and ownership records. Um, and so there's a town hall, it's on fire. There's like an army, they have a red and black flag. I don't actually know if they had red and black flags back then. I don't remember exactly what year this came into being, but no one's corrected me yet. And I've been doing this thing for like six months. Um, I can't count either, apparently, not six months. These are rejoicing peasants. They say woo, because they're very excited. They've just been liberated. And this is actually how people responded to this. They marched into these towns with guns, and they were like, we're here to free you. They burned all the tax and ownership records. The priest comes out of the you know, church and is like, these people have been sent by God to, to free us. And, uh, and, and everyone's really excited. And then they march on to the next town, and they do the same thing. And everyone's really excited. And then they march on to the get arrested, um, like an army comes and gets them and then they all go to jail. But they only go to jail for a couple of months because in times of crazy social upheaval, people don't go to jail for very long because all the social upheaval keeps, seems to keep getting people cycled to the prisons very quickly. Um, so they were only, he was only in jail for a couple of months uh, before he went back to Russia, where he was from, to get involved in activism against police brutality. Thank you. And uh, so in 1878, Stepniak assassinates the chief of the Tsar's secret police in the streets with a dagger and gets away. And uh, the chief of police says, uh, why are you holding a flag while you're stabbing me? Which is a very accurate question. This is him holding a flag. And then this person says some internet stuff and no one's really certain why. Um, and uh, so he does this and he gets away. It says right there. Um, and, uh, and then he goes and goes to England and becomes a popular novelist and playwright. And, uh, and everyone likes him, and he's a contemporary of Oscar Wilde's, and he's you know doing all this stuff. He's the uh, first Russian national to write a novel in English in the annals of English literature. So he's very important somehow in that way. And uh, and then he like gets hit by a train one night when he's really young, 